Hi there. Good day to you. This is day number 30 in the Digging Deeper Daily reading calendar. Today it's my high privilege to read to you Genesis 49 and 50, Job 30, and 1 Peter 4. So, let's turn to Genesis 49. In yesterday's reading, Jacob blessed Pharaoh, Joseph led powerfully during the worst of the famine, and Jacob blessed Ephraim and Manasseh, putting the younger Ephraim above his older brother. And if you remember Jacob's story, you'll know where he got that idea. Genesis 49 Jacob called for his sons and said, Gather round, and I will tell you what will happen to you in the future. Come together and listen, sons of Jacob. Listen to your father, Israel. Reuben, my firstborn, you are my strength and the first child of my manhood, the proudest and strongest of all my sons. You are like a raging flood, but you will not be the most important for you slept with my concubine and dishonored your father's bed. Simeon and Levi are brothers. They use their weapons to commit violence. I will not join in their secret talks, nor will I take part in their meetings, for they killed men in anger and they crippled bulls for sport. A curse be on their anger because it is so fierce, and on their fury because it is so cruel. I will scatter them throughout the land of Israel. I will disperse them among its people. Judah, your brothers will praise you. You hold your enemies by the neck. Your brothers will bow down before you. Judah is like a lion, killing his victim and returning to his den, stretching out and lying down. No one dares disturb him. Judah will hold the royal scepter, and his descendants will always rule. Nations will bring him tribute and bow in obedience before him. He ties his young donkey to a grapevine, to the very best of the vines. He washes his clothes in blood-red wine. His eyes are darker than wine. His teeth are whiter than milk. Zebulun will live beside the sea. His shore will be a haven for ships. His territory will reach as far as Sidon. Issachar is no better than a donkey that lies stretched out between its saddlebags. But he sees that the resting place is good and that the land is delightful. So he bends his back to carry the load and is forced to work as a slave. Dan will be a ruler for his people. They will be like the other tribes of Israel. Dan will be a snake at the side of the road, a poisonous snake beside the path that strikes at the horse's heel so that the rider is thrown off backwards. I wait for your deliverance, Lord. Gad will be attacked by a band of robbers, but he will turn and pursue them. Asher's land will produce rich food. He will provide food fit for a king. Naphtali is a deer that runs free, who bears lovely fawns. Joseph is like a wild donkey by a spring, a wild colt on the hillside. His enemies attack him fiercely and pursue him with their bows and arrows. But his bow remains steady 
and his arms are made strong by the power of the mighty God of Jacob, by the shepherd, the protector of Israel. It is your father's God who helps you, the Almighty God who blesses you with blessings of rain from above and of deep waters from beneath the ground, blessings of many cattle and children, blessings of corn and flowers, blessings of ancient mountains, delightful things from everlasting hills. May these blessings rest on the head of Joseph on the brow of the one set apart from his brothers. Benjamin is like a vicious wolf. Morning and evening he kills and devours. These are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their father said as he spoke a suitable word of farewell to each son. Then Jacob commanded his sons, now I am going to join my people in death. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite at Machpelah east of Mamre in the land of Canaan. Abraham bought this cave and field from Ephron for a burial ground. That is where they buried Abraham and his wife Sarah. That is where they buried Isaac and his wife, Rebekah, and that is where I buried Leah. The field and the cave in it were bought from the Hittites. Bury me there. When Jacob had finished giving instructions to his sons, he laid back down and died. Genesis 50 Joseph threw himself on his father, crying and kissing his face. Then Joseph gave orders to embalm his father's body. It took forty days, the normal time for embalming. The Egyptians mourned for him seventy days. When the time of mourning was over, Joseph said to the king's officials, Please take this message to the king. When my father was about to die, he made me promise him that I would bury him in the tomb which he had prepared in the land of Canaan. So please let me go and bury my father, and then I will come back. The king answered, Go and bury your father as you promised you would. So Joseph went to bury his father. All the king's officials, the senior men of his court, and all the leading men of Egypt went with Joseph. His family, his brothers, and the rest of his father's family all went with him. Only their small children and their sheep, goats, and cattle stayed in the region of Goshen. Men in chariots and men on horseback also went with him. It was a huge group. When they came to the threshing place at Atad, east of the Jordan, they mourned loudly for a long time. And Joseph performed mourning ceremonies for seven days. When the citizens of Canaan saw those people mourning at Atad, they said, What a solemn ceremony of mourning the Egyptians are holding! That's why the place was named Abel Mizraim. Footnote. Abel Mizraim sounds like the Hebrew for mourning of the Egyptians. So Jacob's sons did as he had commanded them. They carried his body to Canaan and buried it in the cave at Machpelah, east of Mamre, in the field which Abraham had bought from Ephron the Hittite for a burial ground. After Joseph had buried his father, he returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone with him for the funeral. After the death of their father, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still hates us and plans to pay us back for all the harm we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph. Before our father died, he told us to ask you, Please forgive the crime your brothers committed when they wronged you. 
Now please forgive us the wrong that we, the servants of your father's God, have done. Joseph cried when he received this message. Then his brothers themselves came and bowed down before him. They said, Here we are before you as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, I can't put myself in the place of God. You plotted evil against me, but God turned it into good in order to preserve the lives of many people who are alive today because of what happened. You have nothing to fear. I will take care of you and your children. So he reassured them with kind words that touched their hearts. Joseph continued to live in Egypt with his father's family. He was a hundred and ten years old when he died. He lived to see Ephraim's children and grandchildren. He also lived to receive the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, into the family. He said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will certainly take care of you and lead you out of this land to the land he solemnly promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then Joseph asked his people to make a vow. Promise me that when God leads you to that land, you will take my body with you. So Joseph died in Egypt at the age of a hundred and ten. They embalmed his body and put it in a coffin. And now we turn to Job 30. This is the second of Job's three chapters stating his complaints. Yesterday, Job spoke of his previous blessed life and high position. In this chapter, he tells of his anguish. Job 30 But men younger than I am make fun of me now. Their fathers have always been so worthless that I wouldn't let them help my dogs guard the sheep. They were a bunch of worn-out men, too weak to do any work for me. They were so poor and hungry that they would gnaw dry roots all night in wild, desolate places. They pulled up the plants of the desert and ate them, even the tasteless roots of the broom tree. Everyone drove them away with shouts as if they were shouting at thieves. They had to live in caves, in holes dug in the sides of cliffs. Out in the wilds they howled like animals and huddled together under the bushes. A worthless bunch of nameless nobodies, they were driven out of the land. But now they come and laugh at me. I'm nothing but a joke to them. They treat me with disgust. They think they're too good for me, and even come and spit in my face. Because God has made me weak and helpless, they turn against me with all their fury. This mob attacks me head on. They send me running. They prepare their final assault. They cut off my escape and try to destroy me, and there is no one to stop them. They pour through the holes in my defenses and come crashing down on top of me. I'm overcome with terror. My dignity is gone like a puff of wind and my prosperity like a cloud. Now I'm about to die. There is no relief for my suffering. At night my bones all ache. The pain that gnaws me never stops. God seizes me by the collar and twists my clothes out of shape. He throws me down in the mud. I'm no better than dirt. I call to you, O God, but you never answer. And when I pray, you pay no attention. You are treating me cruelly. You persecute me with all your power. You let the wind blow me away. You toss me about in a raging storm. I know you're taking me off to my death, to the fate in store for everyone. Why do you attack a ruined man? 
one who can do nothing but beg for pity. Don't I weep with people in trouble and feel sorry for those in need? I hoped for happiness and light, but trouble and darkness came instead. I'm torn apart by worry and pain. I've had day after day of suffering. I go about in gloom without any sunshine. I stand in public and plead for help. My voice is sad and lonely as the cries of a jackal or an ostrich. My skin has turned dark. I'm burning with fever. Where once I heard joyful music, now I hear only mourning and weeping. And now let's turn to 1 Peter 4. Yesterday in chapter 3 he gave instructions to wives, husbands, and all Christians, particularly when we suffer. Note the final verses of chapter 3 having to do with Noah's day and the spirits in prison are interpreted for us in chapter 4, verse 6. That's why I suggest that we begin by reading 1 Peter 3, 17 through 22 again. 1 Peter 3, beginning at verse 17. For it is better to suffer for doing good if this should be God's will, then for doing evil. For Christ died for sins, once and for all, a good man on behalf of sinners, in order to lead you to God. He was put to death physically, but made alive spiritually, and in his spiritual existence he went and preached to the imprisoned spirits. These were the spirits of those who had not obeyed God when he waited patiently during the days that Noah was building his boat. The few people in the boat, eight in all, were saved through the water, which was a symbol pointing to baptism which now saves you. It is not the washing away of bodily dirt, but the promise made to God from a good conscience. It saves you through the resurrection of Christ Jesus, who has gone to heaven and is at the right-hand side of God, ruling over all angels and heavenly authorities and powers. 1 Peter 4 Since Christ suffered physically, you too must strengthen yourselves with the same way of thinking that he had because whoever suffers physically is no longer involved with sin. From now on, then, you must live the rest of your earthly lives controlled by God's will and not by human desires. You've spent enough time in the past doing what the heathen like to do. Your lives were spent in indecency, lust, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and the disgusting worship of idols. Now the heathen are surprised when you don't join them in the same wild and reckless living, and so they insult you. But they will have to give an account of themselves to God, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. That's why the good news was preached also to the dead, to those who have been judged in their physical existence as everyone is judged. It was preached to them so that in their spiritual existence they may live as God lives. The end of all things is near. You must be self-controlled and alert to be able to pray. Above everything, love one another earnestly, because love covers over many sins. Open your homes to each other without complaining. Each one, as a good manager of God's different gifts, must use for the good of others the special gift he has received from God. Whoever preaches must preach God's messages. Whoever serves must serve with the strength that God gives, 
so that in all things praise may be given to God through Christ Jesus, to whom belong glory and power forever and ever. Amen. My dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful test you are suffering, as though something unusual were happening to you. Rather, be glad that you're sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may be full of joy when His glory is revealed. Happy are you if you are insulted because you are Christ's followers. This means that the glorious Spirit, the Spirit of God, is resting on you. If any of you suffer, it must not be because you're a murderer or a thief or a criminal or a meddler in other people's affairs. However, if you suffer because you're a Christian, don't be ashamed of it, but thank God that you bear Christ's name. The time has come for judgment to begin, and God's own people are the first to be judged. If it starts with us, how will it end for those who do not believe the good news from God? As the scripture says, it's difficult for good people to be saved. What then will become of godless sinners? So then, those who suffer because it's God's will for them should by their good actions trust themselves completely to their Creator who always keeps His promise. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, our God and our Creator, again I want to pray for my brothers and sisters who are suffering. Lord, I pray that each one and every one of us who suffers will turn our sufferings to the right purpose. That is, that they will teach us to purify our lives so that we will not be any longer controlled by our human desires. And Lord, may we understand what it means to be sharing in Christ's sufferings. We are being given a privilege of suffering like Him and for His glory. And so we can even be glad, we can even be satisfied because of that thought. And Lord, in that situation, may we shine with the glory of the Spirit, Your own Spirit, because He's resting upon us. Father, be with us too, to teach us about our spiritual gifts, that we might serve you wholeheartedly and in the way that fits each one of us and our circumstances. Because of these things and many others in this wonderful chapter, we pray, Lord, that the glory of Christ would be seen in us.